So, um, a little bit about myself, just because you thought, well, who's this guy? My name's Cody. I live in Napomo. I got saved when I was 21 years old. Uh, I'm currently 29, so it's funny when I tell some of my students that I got saved when I was 21, they said, wait a minute, and they do the math real quick, and they say, I've been a Christian longer than you have. <laughs> and I said, that is mathematically accurate. <laughs> it's, but it's, it's very funny. Uh, I'm a seminary student right now. I was attending Talbot School of Theology in person back in 2016, but a number of things happened, and now I'm back here. I lived in Napomo my whole life, and I'm currently the Bible t teacher at Coastal Christian School. So through God's divine providence, here I am. Uh, so all 7th through 12th graders come through me at po uh, P uh, Pismo Beach's Coastal Christian School. Um, and I love apologetics. I love, if you know what apologetics is from the Greek word apologia, which means to make a defense for your faith, uh, mentioned in 1 Peter 3.15, but it's always been a, a passion of mine, and you'll hear more about this as I, I tell the story, but I've always been excited about understanding my faith on a, on a rational, intellectual level as well. So every Friday, I actually have what's called Open Question Friday among my students, in which I'll actually, it's the whole class, we just pause everything to become kind of an open Q&A forum for my students, and it's really fun. I get some weird questions from junior hires, you have no idea. It's, it's, it's fun. But anyway, just a little about me, and Wayne asked me to preach weeks ago, and I was trying to figure out, oh my gosh, what am I going to teach on? What's like the, the one thing? I love, I love expositional preaching. I love breaking down the Bible and explaining what it means, because I think it does a very good job explaining itself sometimes. I think that's wonderful. But as I'm, as I'm walking to my classroom one Monday morning, I'm texting my buddy saying, dude, I have no idea what I'm going to preach on. And I walk into the room, and it hit me. The smell. And I thought, okay, you know what, that's not junior high boy. There's something seriously, there's, there's something severely wrong going on in the room. And I opened up and I thought, where is the source of this? The, last, the, the week before, some of my seniors, especially the senior girls, like, it smells bad in here. It's just that, that sassy little voice. But it was really funny. When you walk into the room and you think, okay, this can no longer be ignored. Something needs to change. I need to find the source of this immediately. The kids will be here in an hour, and I cannot. This, this must be addressed immediately. And I, I located the source of the smell, and there was this wicker basket in my room. It's literally this big chest. And I, it, I inherited it from the previous teacher there. And it's full of costumes that the seventh graders use to, to make little, little Bible skits and stuff. And I open it up, and there is the perpetrator. It is a dead mouse. And I thought, oh dear, like this needs to go away immediately. And it's just, it's, it's, it's putrid. I'm sorry to, to mention this, but I just, I'm looking at this going, oh my goodness. And he had clearly been there for a while. Um, the clothes had been soaked through, and I just thought, this is, this is not good. Like this could be, they can never touch these things again. I never use them anyway, I prefer just to exposit the scriptures and help them understand because I'd rather them be in this than playing around in, in little little costumes. But it's funny where I, I told the staff later, if you guys see me in the security cam, there's cameras kind of rummaging through this, the, the school kitchen and stuff, I'm looking for gloves because I thought this, 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 this needs to be addressed. And the, the smell remained and I took him out as, it's, it's weird when you're put like a little animal. <laughs> so, but as I'm preaching, I'm texting my buddy and he's laughing at me the whole time. Just the whole, it's just, it's like, and I say, oh man, I'm worried about being ritually unclean. <laughs> and then it hit me and I thought, ritual uncleanness? I think we gotta mention something about that. I just, it just, God said, you're welcome, I gave you something to speak to Park Hill Church. So here I go. So if you guys have any reason for, if you're affected by this at all, no, it was a dead mouse that got me here. So. <laughs> God is sovereign and he's able to do those things. But anyway, so, but it, it got me thinking about just the, the idea of uncleanness and unholiness that we see in scripture. One word that describes God more than loving is the word holy, you'll see in scripture. And, and some of my students have a hard time with that, like, what does that mean? You've probably sung it a lot, like a lot in all the hymns, like everything. And, and it really, goes to show that when, when, when God is holy and we recognize that holiness, we soon, if we're seeing it correctly, recognize our own inadequacy and how much we've fallen from that, if we're seeing it correctly. And I was, I was saying that, I, I tell my students, 
Imagine the sun. Now, you always got to be careful with Bible analogies because sometimes it, it can go weird places. I get on them all the time for, you know, don't use the egg or the tree to describe the Trinity. They say, well, what about the fidget spinner? You know, those little, if you're familiar with those little things. If you're not, that's okay. But uh, they show up a lot in school. But I say, imagine the sun. And the sun is, is good. It provides us with warmth. It helps our plants to stay alive and such. But if you approach the sun incorrectly, it's dangerous. It's very dangerous. Not because it's somehow bad, but because it's so good. And I, I use that analogy to help them understand a little better because as we ap approach God, yes, He is loving, yes, He is gracious, yes, He is merciful, but He's also holy. And I, I, I'll hear a little bit in my own story just playing into this, but if you have a Bible, we'll be in Isaiah chapter 6. And this is Isaiah recognizing his own unholiness. So I've titled this sermon going, Woe is me to here I am. And recognizing how God removes our own filthiness and our own unholiness to equip us to be his representative and send us out on mission. And that is my one shot at glory right here. But one thing that's, that's interesting, as you read the book of Leviticus, and I remember the first time reading Leviticus, I was very confused. You'll hear more about that in a bit. But I remember reading this book thinking, oh my gosh, there's so much blood and death and all these cleansing rituals and such. And the reason is because the high priest needed to be ritually pure. He had to be cleansed before he would enter God's presence. And if he failed to do that, he would die. I tell my students, they get really excited when I tell them, you know, they'd actually tie a rope around the ankle of the high priest or his waist, and they have little bells on the, on the tassels of his clothing. So as he's walking into the holy place and if they did it wrong, and you know, he falls over and dies, they'd say, you know, Aaron, you in there? And they'd pull on the rope just to let him, and it's like, okay, he's, he's clearly, he kicked the bucket right there. But that's how holy God is. If you approach God incorrectly, you die. And that's what's important about this to understand. And to make it even worse, if you touch something associated with death, like a dead mouse, whether that be mold, blood, a dead body, you're, you're, that, that unholy, unclean thing, its unholiness was imputed to you in such a way that you actually had to undergo further cleansing rituals so that you might be once again in a pure state before God. And that's very important to understand as we go into this story. So follow me here in Isaiah chapter 6. I'm going to read the passage. I'm going to read the first five verses and I'll stop and comment on some things. So hear the word of the Lord. In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up. And the train of his robe filled the temple. Above him stood the seraphim. Each had six wings. With two he covered his face, and with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one called to another and said, here's our word, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the foundations of the threshold shook at the voice of him who called. And the house was filled with smoke. And I, says, I said, woe is me, for I am lost. For I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. It says, just backing up a bit, it says that this is the year that King Uzziah died. And most scholars believe this was around 740 B.C., but whenever a king died and his son would ascend the throne, it was a very tumultuous and chaotic time. In fact, uh, in my first year at seminary, I wrote a paper on Psalm chapter 2, which says, why do the nations rage and all the peoples plot in vain? If you actually read that psalm, it's a coronation psalm, which means that it was actually uh, it was read at the coronation of a new king of Israel. And the reason it mentions the nations rebelling is because it's an opportune time to cause chaos. His yoke is now thrown off, and now we have a shot at rebellion. And then it goes on to address the new king. It says, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask for me, Now I'll make the nations your inheritance. 
You'll crush them with a, a rod of iron to smash the rebellion because it was a very tumultuous time. So that's probably on the mind of the people right now. It's King Uzziah died, and now we're getting the new king all ready to go. He's all groomed and ready to take the job, and it's probably a, a very tumultuous time. But in the midst of this, Isaiah, serving in the temple, sees the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filling the temple. So in the midst of this transition of leadership, in this potentially chaotic time, you still have the Lord, who is the true king, sitting there saying, I haven't changed. During the midst of all this chaos, I am immutable, I am faithful. I am still the same God under the last guy. And that's important right here. And he, he sees God, and it's this incredibly powerful and, and passionate scene where it says he's high and lifted up, the train of his robes filling the temple. And then he's got his own chorus where he's got these, these angelic seraphim, and they, they look weird. You can just imagine the, the picture. All he's like, what do they look like? Well, just sometimes I take my students through Revelation, and sometimes I say, okay, see this scene? Draw it. I want to see what you see. And sometimes I get, they're awful drawing artists sometimes, so sometimes it gets in the really weird territory. I thought, what, what is that? Like, oh, it's the second coming. It looks like a potato. Like, I don't understand. <laughs> but it's okay. Grace to them. But as I, Isaiah is seeing the scene, he sees even these angelic beings shouting that God is holy. And the, the building's shaking. And it's filling up with smoke, showing that God is present there. Look at Isaiah's response. And I said, woe is me, cursed is me, for I am lost, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips, for my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. He is consumed with a sense of his own unworthiness, because he sees God's holiness, and if you're seeing God's holiness correctly, you should look at yourself and realize, I am unclean. There's something wrong with me. I am unworthy to be in your presence. And I, I just got to share my own story about this because I thought I was a good person growing up. I grew up in a, a nominally Christian home. Uh, my, my family did have their own struggles. If you're ever talking to them, you could, you could ask them that. But for, for the most part, I thought I was a pretty good person. I didn't do drugs. I didn't do anything immoral necessarily. Um, I, you could joke about it because you're like, yeah, of course you did. But, <laughs> but I was a good kid. I was a straight A student. I was an athlete in high school. But then I went off to community college and I, I went to youth group simply because I thought the girls were cute. If that's any sense of just kind of your inadequacy and the fact, oh, your uncleanness. There it is. But even that church that I was attending in Nepomo that met in, in Nepomo High School's cafeteria, it eventually fell apart and I felt nothing for it. I thought, is the youth group still going? Yes. Okay, I'm good. That was, that was, that was my whole, that was the depth of my Christianity. And really, I, I believed there was a God. I, I was in no time an atheist. And I didn't know where I stood on Jesus at the time, but all I knew was that I'm a good person. God is some kind of cosmic grandfather figure that he just leaves me alone, gives me what I want, takes me to heaven when I die, and then leaves me alone forever. That was my view of God for years, my whole life, up until in community college where, you know, it gets a little difficult, so it's a lot harder than high school. But then I took an ethics class and I was listening to the professor, and we got into all these different moral theories. We were looking at the Vedas, like the ancient Hindu texts, and we looked at ancient Buddhism, and even some of the atheistic philosophers like Frederick Nietzsche, Jeremy Bentham, Immanuel Kant. And we eventually got to Christianity. And I remember my, my professor, he, he says one Thursday, we didn't have class on Friday, but he says one Thursday, okay, on Monday we're starting Christianity, make sure you go get a Bible. And if you don't have one, go hunt down a pastor. They'll give you one for free. They're suckers. <laughs> I thought, well, I think I have a Bible in my house. So me being the expert on Christianity, go home and I dust off this green NIV that my aunt had given me before she died of cancer. She said, read this. You need this. Just a layer of dust over the thing just shows just kind of just the state of who I was. And I showed up on Monday, I put the Bible on the desk, and I think I'm such a big shot, I'm sitting there in the front row, like, ask me anything. <laughs> I knew nothing. 
I knew absolutely nothing. And I was saying that, and the professor gets up there, and of course we, we stayed on his ethical guidelines. We looked at the Sermon on the Mount and how he was really excited when, when Peter chops off Malchus's ears and he goes, no. I thought, okay, there's that. But I, 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 as it went on, I, I sensed a little bit of an agenda going on here. I didn't know much about Christianity, but something about what he was saying seemed wrong. And as I'm listening to him preach, I knew something was wrong when he gets up there and says, and I quote, this, I remember two things he said, but this thing for sure I recall him saying. He says, if Jesus was alive to get, today, he'd be fighting against uh, Ayn Rand and her apostle Ronald Reagan. And I thought, where did this come from? Like, what in the world? And I raised my hand and said, excuse me, can we address the whole like, Jesus, Son of God, dying on the cross for our sins thing? That seems kind of a big deal in the Bible. And he goes, that's theology. We're not talking about that right now. I said, okay, fine. He continues, and I thought, you know, I, I, I really, I'm sitting in the front row, and I think, we really need to, can we talk about, I, it seems like a central theme. He keeps addressing it. And he goes, we're not talking about that. And as class is ending, he says, see me after class. I go, okay, what's going on here? And he walked up to me, and, and the, the general sense is, do not challenge me in my class ever again. <laughs> And me, being a very prideful young man, decided, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to go learn about this Jesus guy. I'm going to go learn more about him. So every day after class, before going into work, I'd sit down in the cafeteria at Allen Hancock College, and I'd open the Bible and just start reading. And I said, well, I'm going to start in the beginning. So I start in Genesis and start reading, and oh my gosh, I was, I was a hardcore evolutionist at the time. And I was looking at that going, where are the dinosaurs? Like, what in the world? Like, where's, where, where are they? And they realized, oh my goodness, this is a book about everything and it's out of order. <laughs> and I thought, and I'm looking thinking, oh my gosh, Abraham was going to do what to his son? Lot did what to his daughters? I thought, oh my goodness, what in the world? And then I kept moving. I started reading Exodus and I thought, I've seen Prince of Egypt. I know how this works. <laughs> Little did I know the story keeps going. And I thought, what in the world? It was an instructional manual on how to build a tent. And I thought, it's like reading a phone book. Oh my gosh. And then I got to Leviticus and I was just hammered at Leviticus. I thought, there is so much blood in this book. Leviticus, it's, a, it's, a, it's an instructional instruction manual on ritual washings and on how to sacrifice certain animals. And I was thinking, why don't Christians do this today? I was slowly figuring out the atonement at this point. I was figuring out the need for Jesus. And as I'm, as I'm going on, I'm sitting there going, what happens if I run out of cows? What happens if I run out of livestock? I don't know. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to flip over to the, the New Testament. This sounds, Jesus sounds a lot nicer. So I flipped over to, the, to where the letters start turning red. And I got seven chapters into Matthew and I slammed the book shut because it was terrifying. People say, what are you talking about? Jesus is nice. I thought, have you read what he says in the Sermon on the Mount? It says, you heard in the law, you shall not murder. I said, I read the Ten Commandments. I, I read that part. And he goes, but I tell you. I thought, oh no. It says, if you have hate in your heart from your brother, you have already committed murder. And I thought, oh shoot, I'm guilty. He goes on to say, you, you've read in the law, you shall not commit adultery. And I thought, I'm good. I haven't done that. But I tell you, I thought, oh, come on. And he goes, I tell you, if you've lusted after a woman in your heart, you've already committed adultery in your heart. And just that little, it's like, what did you look at on the internet last night, buddy? Just this little, all of a sudden, I was hit, like Isaiah was, I was hit with a sense of my own unworthiness. It's as if Jesus was sitting in this very empty cafeteria across the table from me and just letting me have it. And the dagger really started to twist when I saw Matthew 7, 21, which says, Not all who say to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father. And I just felt my whole world fall apart right there. I was, I was having an emotional crisis right there in an empty cafeteria with nobody to talk to. And I'm, I'm panicking. I'm thinking, oh my gosh, this is not the cosmic grandfather that I thought this was. This was, this was a holy God. And I, I see all these Christians around, they seem so happy and they seem so excited about God's love. And I thought, he seems scary. 
It seems terrifying sometimes. And I was sitting there reflecting on this, sitting at a, a, a table in, in, in this empty cafeteria, and just thinking, I'm gonna go outside, get hit by a car, and go straight to hell. And I was horrified just looking at this. And I'm just repeating over and over, I can't do this, I can't do this. I'm just, I'm looking at the commands of God and just realizing how bad I've blown it. I might as well have been saying, woe is me for I have unclean lips. I have unclean every, I'm unclean. And it was in that moment and call me crazy, but I was sitting there and I heard a voice in my own head as I'm saying, I can't do this, I can't do this, I can't do this. And the voice says, exactly. That's why you need me. I didn't think anything of it. I thought maybe I just had some weird thought. So I get up, I go home, and for weeks and months, I stay up late. I'm just reading the book, and I'm thinking, okay, I gotta cut bacon out of my diet, because Leviticus says something about that. <laughs> and I'm, I'm just being very weird about it. I'm just reading, and I go to Revelation, and it gets worse, and I jump around, and I'm just confused, and every night I'm staying up till one, two, three o'clock in the morning reading this thing. I'm just throwing it against the wall going, Lord, if you're there, I need to know. And I am ruined. I'm destroyed. I feel like Isaiah. I'm in a state of brokenness. And eventually I'm, I'm, I'm typing messages on Facebook and people are, can see it's very clearly I'm having this internal struggle of, of I'm unclean. I'm broken. I'm like Isaiah in this passage. And then people start to notice and they say, hey, would you like to join us at Bible study sometime? I say, yes, I have, I have a lot of questions. I, I, I'm making a growing list at this point because I have, I have lots of questions. And, and these, a lot of people, the reason I had found that church was because that youth group had fallen apart, praise God. I'm not saying it was bad, but I'm just saying it was an idol in my life that needed to be cut out. And they started attending this, this Bible study in Santa Maria. And they, they invited me in. It was, I was like a fly on the wall. I'm just sitting in the back thinking, who are you people? Like, what are you talking about? I was so confused. Everyone's speaking functionally Chinese to me. And then they came up to me afterwards and they say, hey, so you're new. Do you have any questions? They say, oh, you have no idea. <laughs> I have questions about dinosaurs and gay people and my dad who may not, may have not been a believer or the, and the guy in the jungle who's never heard before. And the poor guy think, oh, those are good questions. And this, this continued on for weeks and weeks. And I'll pick it up again a little bit, but let's go back to Isaiah. So he's, he is met with a sense of his uncleanness and his own inadequacy. And then he continues, because that's not where the story ends. If it did, it would be tragic and depressing and painful. But reading on, this is verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a burning coal, that he had taken with tongs from the altar, and he touched my mouth and said, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Notice the seraphim took this coal from the altar, a place where sin was atoned for, a place where, where, sin, where, where, where guilt is removed. And this coal, I mean, it's, I'm at, coals are hot. I don't know if you guys have ever touched one. I'm sure you probably more experienced that. But this is a, a burning object, a little flame. And if you think about it, fire has this amazing ability to purify things. It just, it just burns, the, it just rips out all the impurities. And I just thought, this is a, 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 a pure object, a burning object. And we have something new here. Because I think, you know, usually you touch something unclean like a dead mouse. And its uncleanness is given to you. But in this section, the exact opposite happens. This holy object is being used and it's pressed to Isaiah's lips. And instead of his uncleanness being transferred to it, its purity and holiness is transferred to him in such a way. Now, please don't go and play with around this on fire and be like, we're going to take, take those unclean lips of yours and do this. Like, don't do that. That's bad. <laughs> But we have something new here where we have cleanness and holiness being given to that which is unclean and undeserving. I thought, this is interesting. This changes things up like crazy. And it's, it's not the first time in the Bible we've seen that. Or it's not the, not the last time, excuse me. Because later we see in the book of Ezekiel, we see this, this image of a, of a giant temple. 
And from the temple, there starts off a little trickle of water. Again, the temple is a holy place where heaven meets earth. And you have this trickle of water that turns into a giant stream and eventually goes all the way to the Dead Sea. Whether this is going to be a literal temple or some kind of metaphor, I don't know. I think we can all just be friends in the midst of it all. But as, this, as the water goes forth from the temple, it goes to where the Dead Sea is, which is dead. I'm going to Israel in February, and I'm told that the only thing that lives in the Dead Sea is, is salt-loving parasites and bacteria. And I thought, I actually heard one time the Romans actually tried to drink from the waters of the Dead Sea during a siege, and they all ended up dying. A good number thought, oh shoot, this is a bad place. Nothing's alive here. I'm actually told from a, a seminary professor, there is one plant that grows around the Dead Sea. It's called Sodom's apple. You bite it, it's poisonous, it'll kill you. I thought, this place sounds lovely. <laughs> but the water of the, dead, of, of the temple that flows from it, everything it touches, it gives life to. And it's taking the Dead Sea and it's exhumed into a place of life. I thought, this is interesting. There's this new theme we see in the scripture. And then we get to Jesus. Because I, I find it interesting. In the same way that the coal took away Isaiah's uncleanness, so Jesus takes away our uncleanness. And just to, to jump back into my story a little bit, as I was going on, I was, I was talking to people. I, st I was staying with that Bible study for months. And they eventually said, Cody, you understand that Jesus paid it all, right? I think, what, what does that even mean? Like, how? But you're, you're still unclean afterwards. And I remember they said, hey, you know what you should do? We have a late service that meets at 8 p.m. every Sunday night. You should join us sometime. And I started attending, and I sat in the front row with a notepad. It was, it was 8 o'clock at night. People called it the devil service because the music was too loud sometimes. But it was perfect for me, like a little, little, uh, little heathen coming out of that. But as I was sitting there listening, and he said, we're going to start and go through the book of Romans. And as I was listening, every week we did a chapter. And if you look at the book of Romans, you know, chapter 1 says that we're all sinners. Chapter 2, the moral law will not save us. Chapter 3, and I thought, every week I was sitting there going, true, true, true. It's like, wow, this is, this is lining up with my own experience very well. And it talks about how we're justified in Christ. We're all sinners. And how through Christ... We're made holy, we're made pure, we're made accepted in God's sight. I thought, tell me more. And it kept me coming back every week. And by the time, it was November 7th, 2010, where I was sitting in the front row like normal, and Pastor James gets up there, who's a dear friend of mine to this day. He gets up there and he reads one verse. He says, Romans 8, 1, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. And all the all the chaos in my mind, all the condemnation, all the, the, you're not good enough, you should kill yourself, you're unworthy, all of a sudden it just went silent. I'm sitting there reading this thinking, tell me more, I need to know more, tell me more. And then he explained how Christ lived a sinless life and how even though I'm unworthy and I'm, I'm a failure, how Christ's own righteousness at the cross has been given to me and he has taken my sins upon himself. This is mentioned in 2 Corinthians 5.21 where it says that he who knew no sin became sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And as I was hearing this and I just thought, my, 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 my vision of God just completely transformed that night. He was no longer an abusive father waiting to punch me in the mouth for any little wrong thing. The vision I, 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 was, I was thinking about was, I imagine this, this holy, righteous, powerful king now getting off the throne and getting on his knees before a child. And the child is, is dirty. But he has his arms open wide and tears in his eyes saying, I love you. You belong in the throne room. I've taken care of your deepest problem. Come to me. You belong here. You're my child. And he finished off talking about Romans 8, uh, 38 and 39, that, that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ. And my, just, boosh, just the whole world just fell apart. And I thought, oh my goodness. And I went home and I just thought, I want this. I want this. This is completely transformed me. Jesus took away my uncleanness and made me clean. And I was thinking about how it mentioned in the book of Mark. 
Because it's, it's, Jesus goes around and he shows this reality by going around and, and, and demonstrating with people. One of the people who were outcasts, who were very unclean at the time, were lepers. And we're not sure the exact nature of the leprosy that's shown up, you know, whether it looks like modern day leprosy or, or something that's maybe extinct. But lepers were treated as unclean. They were required by God's law to go outside the camp because they were, they, look at them, it's on their skin. They're clearly on their body is a representation of their own uncleanness. And every time someone came close, they were supposed to cover their face and say, unclean, unclean, stay away from me. I'm unworthy. In fact, if one ever came close to town, which they weren't supposed to go in, the Pharisees actually had a law, throw rocks at them. Keep them away. And then you have this amazing moment in Mark chapter 1, verse 4, you don't have to go there, but he said, and the leper came to him, imploring him, and kneeling said to him, if you will, you can make me clean. Verse 41 Moved with pity, he stretched out his hand and touched him. He didn't have to do that. We can see elsewhere in the Bible that Jesus is perfectly capable of healing at a distance. The fact that this man may not have had a... a may, no one may have touched him in potentially years. Not a handshake, a high five, a hug. None of those things. But Jesus, first thing he does is he puts his hand, he touches him and let him know, I'll take care of this. I am willing. Be clean. And the leprosy left him, and he was made clean. So the incredible love of God and the fact that Jesus, like that coal, is now, instead of, it's, it's funny, on my open question Fridays, you know when he touched the leper, did that make him unclean? I'm like, no, it made the leper clean. He transfers his own righteousness and holiness to you. So if you're here today and you think, I'm unworthy, I've blown it too bad, your sins were taken care of 2,000 years ago with no help from you, outside of you. Paid in full. Love God. All because of what Jesus has done. And I just, that blew my mind. And just to, to snap back to Isaiah one more time. I love this. And he doesn't just leave him there. He doesn't just clean him, but he cleans him for a purpose. He says right here, I'll wrap up shortly. But he says in verse 8, And I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. He says to go. And he's given, honestly, a very unpopular message. Israel was in a state of uncleanness. But I just imagine him overwhelmed with joy. You don't just volunteer like that. You were just in the doghouse, buddy. You were just in trouble. But notice how he's made clean by God, not by his own efforts. He's made clean, and he's sent on mission saying, go tell your story. I love the, the picture of the, the demon-possessed man where Jesus heals him and it goes into the pigs, and the, the man's imploring, take me with you. You've done something incredible for me. You've changed my life. And he says, no, go tell others your story. And here I am telling you guys my story and how I've been transformed. He's taken away our uncleanness, and he'll take us on an adventure. He says, come with me. He's in the business of taking, taking broken, unholy people and using them to preach his word. He mentions this in 1 Corinthians. He says, consider your... It's like, not many of you were noble, not many of you were very smart or strong, but God has chosen these things to reveal his own mercy and his own glory. I love that. And, and, and sometimes we have a difficult message to tell people, yes, you're unclean too, because some people don't see that. They're still blind. They don't see their own uncleanness. Telling people they need to trust Jesus can be difficult, huh, with this story, because... A few years later, I was visiting a friend at UC Santa Barbara. I was on my way to go visit Biola University, where I'd eventually attend. And I remember sitting in there with his living room, and you know, it's, it's, a, it's a messed up place. You know, he's not a believer, and, and none of his roommates were. And you know, there's just sleeping bags over the floor. There's Top Ramen boxes everywhere. I think they, they literally use Bacardi alcohol as mouthwash, and I thought, oh my gosh. And he said, yeah, so... You might want to calm down the whole Christianity thing a little bit. I said, well, why? It's like, well, we have a, a raging atheist here. His name's Oliver. And if he hears you're a Christian, then it's going to be a fun time. All of a sudden, the door kicks open. And I thought, oh, lovely. What's going on here? And this guy walks in and says, excuse me, are you Cody? I said, yeah. He goes, you're a Christian, right? I said, yes. He goes, there's a guy outside who wants to fight you. And I said, 
with words, right? Like, that's kind of important. And I go outside, and there's this guy, Oliver, around a raging bonfire. It's late at night, and he's finishing off an alcohol like this. And I think, oh boy. He throws it on the ground, walks off, and just looks at me, and he says, I have questions for you. And we just have this intellectual sparring match for hours. Eventually, they all start circling around us. I thought, this could turn out really bad. Like, I've seen it. Like, all the, there are a bunch of people around me thinking, oh boy, this turn is sour. This is, this is going to be nasty. But eventually, people get bored and they go to bed. And we're, it's a knockdown, drag out fight. He eventually sobers up by the time we're done with this. But we move into the living room and we're going back and forth. And I'm telling him the message of Jesus and how we've been transformed. And I'm telling him just how Jesus rose from the dead. And, and he, he's finding every excuse in the book to reject the message. He says, yeah, well, what if the disciples just thought that he, they were, that he was a nice guy and wanted to continue his message because it sounded nice? I'm thinking, okay, consider the evidence. These men went to their death for this message. You couldn't even get the guys in the, the Watergate scandal to, to hold their feet to the fire for too long without buckling. And I said, okay, buddy. Which one requires more faith? And he just sat there in stunned silence going, you're right. I don't think I'm an atheist anymore. I don't know if I'm a Christian, but you give me a lot to consider. And we went to bed, this guy wanted to fight me for him, went to bed and we gave each other a big hug. Woke up the next morning, the first thing he does, walks through and gives me a hug saying, that was the best conversation I've ever had in my life. And I thought, those are the kind of adventures that God brings us on. So, and if God wasn't teaching me through all of this, through being clean, I wouldn't be standing here in front of you today. You asked me eight, nine years ago, you'd be, you're teaching the Bible. You'd be like, what? No, that's weird. <laughs> but the fact that Jesus gives new life, he is that coal that takes away our uncleanness and he gives us living water as it mentions in John 7. He purifies us and sends us on mission and he has made me clean, and I am no longer saying, woe is me, even though some days I still am tempted to feel that way. Repent of your sin, please, but also recognize now we have gone from woe is me to here I am. God, I'm yours. You take away my uncleanness. Send me. And with that, I think I'm over time, so I'm going to pray for us, and we'll have the music team back up. So, <laughs> Father God, I pray that everyone here recognizes that it's only in you that holiness and purity and the state of being clean is found. May they not try to make themselves better by their own efforts, but to seek you, the living water that you provide that brings our deadness out and makes us alive. And after that, may in the joy of this new experience be sent out to reach those around us, maybe with an unpopular message, but May all those around us, may their eyes be open to see that they can be clean too and forgiven and accepted and loved in Christ so that God the Father is no longer seen as an abusive father waiting to punish us, but as a king on his knees with his arms open wide to a broken kid saying, you belong in the throne room. Thank you for the honor and privilege of getting to be here today. Bless everyone here. Thank you. In Jesus' name I pray.